everyone. Welcome to the Steve Maxwell Drums Podcast. Don't forget to check us out on our website at www.maxwelldrums.com and then our reverb stores at Steve Maxwell Drums-Chicago and Steve Maxwell Drums-New York. We also have social media, uh, two Instagram accounts, at Maxwell Drum Shop Chicagoland and then at Maxwell Drum Shop. And then also on Facebook, Steve Maxwell and Steve Maxwell Drum Shop. And then, of course, check us out on Twitter at Maxwell Drum Shop. We will interview players, collectors, drum and cymbal builders, and also teachers about all things percussion. And you can go to YouTube if you want to see the video. We'll have pictures of drum shops, of drum sets, badges, cymbals, all kinds of fun stuff. So let's get started. We hope you enjoy it. Three, two, one. Hey again, Dad. How you doing? Hey, good. It's been a while since we did uh, so we did a podcast, so it's good to get back and uh, and do it again. Definitely. Yeah. Everything's uh, returning to normality here, so that's good. And uh, we're going to do one today on on uh, Ludwig, focusing yeah. on that that company. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we did Rogers, and I meant to do more of these. And when we got distracted by uh, activities with uh, the the COVID stuff and all, but it's time to get back to that. So. <laughs> um, yeah, Ludwig, great company. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to spend too, too much time on the history, but just some key points. So, you know, Will, William F. Ludwig uh, Sr. and his brother Theobald started the company and around the turn of the century, and not this century, the last one. And uh, they were very, very innovative. Um, William F. Ludwig was a performer, great player, and uh, bass drum pedal is one of their, their key inventions, a traditional bass drum pedal. They were uh, very, very interested in making uh, just making excellent, excellent drums. And in the uh, early 1900s into the 1920s, uh, they were really well known uh, for the two-piece heavy brass shell, which uh, became known to many of us as the Black Beauty, which is the, the shell that's uh, got that black nickel finish with the engraving to show the, the brass shell through. But they also made that two-piece shell, that heavy two-piece shell, uh, with uh, nickel over. Yeah, some of the best sounding drums ever made, I think. Bingo. They're, they are, and they are still in demand today. That shell is superbly crafted. Uh, the only person today who is doing something even remotely close to that is uh, Adrian Kirschler over in Italy, who makes an exact replica of the Ludwig two-piece shell, and we both yeah. experienced <laughs> a lot of Adrian's stuff, and it's incredible. The, those old drums, yeah, they have uh, the, a lot of the pieces are brass, which I think is a huge part of the sound. And some of those, not all of them, sometimes even the tension rods are brass, which is then maybe a little overkill, but I think it makes a subtle yeah. difference. And Adrian's drums, notably, they actually, a lot of the times, because he makes, I think, his own tension he rods. He does, yeah. So it's even down to that fine of a detail. Yeah. <laughs> and there was the whole you know, thing about the, the, the bearing edge that's welded back against the shell and all of that. But you know, bottom line is those, those drums from that era, that 20s era heavy two-piece shell, that's generally referred to as uh, the hit maker because that, that drum is just used so much and so frequently and is in so much of a demand, it's incredible. But uh, Ludwig also did a great job during that same period of time uh, with uh, wood drums, of course. And especially thinking back in the era before tom-toms were in the mix, you had a large bass drum, maybe it's a 28-inch bass drum, and you had a snare drum and the rest were traps. Uh, little, little accent symbols, there were no ride symbols, there were no tom-toms, Chinese temple blocks, little things like that. But uh, they made very, very excellent solid wood shell snare drums as well in the 20s, and they actually made them uh, through uh, through the 40s even, yeah. and they're great drums. And um, a, a quick thing about the pedals too, mm -hmm. just think about like what a huge innovation that was, because before that, everyone was kind of hitting the bass drum with a drumstick. Oh yeah. You know what I'm, yeah. you've, you've, I'm sure you've, and even, up into the 40s, people would kind of do that as a cool little trick. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, if, if everyone watching and listening has uh, seen it with your right hand, you kind of take the, the stick and, and then you you can see videos of drummers doing this from like 1915, you know, like before yeah. they got their hands on one of these pedals. I, I, I wonder I wonder how they how they thought of that. That'd be so interesting to... Yeah. Because that, that, that's something that I've never really... Uh, I've met the Ludwigs, but I should, I should ask B3 next time. Like, yes, you should how ask. Did they, how did they come up with that? Yeah, he, he probably would, would know the story <laughs> because least. his dad, the chief, would have heard it from uh, it's, if it's Bill not Sr. To, yeah, yeah, if it's not I'm, lost I'm sure to... the story's there. He can tell you that. And another cool thing about Ludwig, it's a Chicago company, and all of their 
I think all of their original factories are still standing, I'm pretty sure. The buildings are, yes. Yeah, that, yeah. That's actually a good point. It was a, a Chicago-based business, for sure. And uh, those, those buildings, the, the, the original building on Damon Street, is still there. I think it's been even, a long time since I, I've been even there. Even the one in Pilsen, which I used to work in the neighborhood of Pilsen, mm -hmm. uh, it's a really cool Chicago neighborhood. If you want to get a real feel of Chicago, it hasn't changed in 100 years, Pilsen. Yeah. At least, you know, the way it looks. Yeah. And Damon Avenue was the was the other location, the one that yeah. I was familiar with. And that's the building still there. It's the, something else now. I the don't, first one's actually obviously. a house. And they I think they started it like in yeah. their garage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a cool... Cool, uh, yeah, cool, cool little thing, you know. They yeah. must have, they must have worked really hard to, to build, uh, build something from nothing all the way. Oh, yeah, I mean, it is truly a uh, self-made, you know, self-made people. That was, uh, there was no easy path to this. That was, uh, there was a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice to make it work. And comp competition too, you know. They had Slingerland well, in the same city. Well, yeah, because city. you had, you know, at that point, Slingerland. And Leedy yes, too. Slingerland was here. Leedy was not here, but not far away in Indianapolis. But at that point in time. There were little small, we should touch on that, thank you. There were little small, kind of like what I'll call boutique builders, uh, which I'm not, I don't mean that in a bad way, they're fine, but they weren't scale builders. But uh, Ludwig did have Slingerland as competition, which started as Slingerland Banjo and Drum Company, interestingly enough, and, and Leedy as competition. So <clears throat> those were the three major manufacturers during that period of time uh, Ludwig, Slingerland, and Leedy, okay. all of which were, were very, very, good companies all making great products so it wasn't as though well one was so far superior to the other all yeah. three were really innovative and good companies and yeah for, for those little boutique ones everyone put in the comments if you want to if you want to because you know there it's it's interesting like to think like uh, right now we we there are so many manufacturers of drums we think that's yeah. kind of a new phenomenon but it's oh, not no, it's no, not not at all it's always been like that you know george stone was making drums back then you had stuff being made Oh, yeah. Wolf? Duplex. Wolf. Yes. One, yeah. uh, Wolf. There were just a bunch of different little... Uh, even uh, Wahlberg and Auge. They, yeah, they, yeah. I don't, I don't even know how to say that properly. Wahlberg and Auger. Or something like that. But <laughs> Frank Wolf. Yeah, Wolf was, was in that mix. There were a lot of... They were the East Coast companies, but uh, still. Yeah, yeah. I think. So sometimes that gets lost in the course of history because they were <laughs> small, and uh, but they weren't insignificant. They all they made good products. It wasn't as if we had... The, they were... They weren't what I would call today. We have some, we have true boutique builders, which is great, and we have some people who are more assemblers, which they are buying ready made things and putting them together with a different badge or whatever. But back then, there was no such thing. Everybody who was creating that product was creating it and creating it here because there were no uh, arrangements in place to build drums overseas and have them shipped here. Everything was yeah. manufactured here in the U.S. Everyone wasn't using the same lug. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we, take, uh, we talked a little bit about that was kind of the 20s era into the 30s with uh, the Black Beauty snares, as we call them, even though that name was not a name used by Ludwig. Ludwig had a standard, a super, and a super sensitive for their metal shell drum line. And let's talk about the difference between those. Yeah. The standard was a very simple on-off throw-off, and the super was a throw-off that we... Uh, today, in today's market, we think of a super sensitive and we think of this drum with extended wires that are thrown off with a, with a bar between the butt side and the strainer side so that they disengage and engage yeah, the same. Kind of a dry sounding drum. A little bit more so, but more sensitive because the wires extend all the way across the head beyond yeah. the shell. And that was one set of wires. Back during this period of time, there, that was called the super. The super sensitive in the 20s was a super but under the top head, there was another set of snare wires made for extra sensitive playing, so hence the name super sensitive. And those snare wires up that would pull up against the top head were obviously made for playing very lightly, but getting extra snare response at very quiet, soft passages. They certainly weren't made for, yeah. uh, you know, whacking away at it, because then you'd damage those I, wires. I wonder, was Ludwig... I, I bet you that's why they became so successful. It was just their innovations, because... They they were probably the first to do that second snare, I think, right? Because other companies copied them later. Uh, I think that's exactly right. I think that's correct. They they were the first people to do that. And Ludwig also, too, with innovation. None Ludwig, of them are leady, but I think it was Ludwig. Yeah. And you have to think of innovation. You also have to think of this is beyond the scope of what we're talking about because we're mostly talking about 
drum set drums, but Ludwig was very innovat innovative with uh, concert percussion instruments. They did a great job with timpani, and they were a major, major provider of, of timpani for decades. Okay. Uh, so it was uh, the concert side of things was a very, very heavy focus for them uh, for timpani, concert drums, and eventually beyond that to mallet percussion as well. And later, like Musser? Right, Musser. Was that a separate company? That well, Ludwig purchased Musser, yeah. and Musser was the source for vibraphones, marimbas, and xylophones. I don't know too much about that. <laughs> yeah. Leedy was a significant leader in the vibraphone, marimba, xylophone business. They invented the vibes, Leedy. Yeah. yeah, in the uh, <laughs> 30s, uh, 40s. I, I heard on. that they were, the even though the one of their guys invented it, they were less than enthusiastic about it because they thought it was just this newfangled thing but then yeah. someone else copied it and they were like oh man we should really start making yeah. these people yeah. like them <laughs> so they took a little sidebar there just to make a comment about about the the concert side and of course later on you're getting into the 60s marching percussion as well but we'll get back to the drum set stuff we talked about the 20s into the 30s and then uh you have that period of time when uh you had the depression so uh, Ludwig, Bill Ludwig Sr. was obligated to sell the company, and he sold it to C.G. Conn, C-O-N-N. This is really interesting stuff. Everyone tune in for this. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they sold the business to Conn, and uh, the, the trouble with that was uh, he still, Bill still wanted to make drums, but he was unable to do so under his own name because he sold his business to C.G. Conn. And I, I thought there was something in there where they thought that uh, he, he thought they were going to maybe keep the factory running or something, but then they just moved everything over to, what was it? It was like South Bend or something, right? Well, what they did was C.G. <clears throat> Khan had also purchased Leedy right. when Leedy went under. So that, in, in what you what you had at this period of time, you started to have C.G. Khan operating both Leedy and then they purchased Ludwig, so at some point in time, there are drums that are produced under the brand name Leedy Ludwig. And those are the drums that were being produced by uh, C.G. Khan. Right. So for Bill Ludwig Sr. to make drums again during that period of time, he couldn't use his name. So he had to use his initials. So WFL drums came to be and lasted, and he made wonderful stuff. You're, you're talking about now, this is where you have the, um, the drum sets really coming into its own with Tom Toms and they're using mahogany shells. So it's a three-ply shell, mahogany, poplar, mahogany, reinforcement rings to keep it round, wonderful warm sound, <laughs> great drums, and that lasted under the WFL name up until the late 50s when he was able to buy his name back from C.G. Khan. And they just, like, started fresh <laughs> right. with, with that. And right about that same it's time is when, um, <clears throat> when C.G. Khan sold the Leedy business to Slingerland. So CG yeah. Con was out of it entirely. Uh, Bill Ludwig Sr. had his name back, and this is right around that very late 50s era, and he was then able to begin using his own name and put his own name on his badge. Then, the badge had to say WFL before that. Right, and then for everyone who's looking at your drums and trying to figure out when they're from, the WFL, there's, I think, three or four different versions of that badge. Actually, it's a, even but it's, more a, it's basically a... Pretty much a gold key, gold colored Keystone and that, badge. Yeah, that that's that's when the Keystone was invented under the WFL name because he said actually B three told me this. He said that the uh, the Keystone is it's it's the support of an arch, and that's yeah. why he wanted to use that's that. That's cool. That's cool. That uh, and then that turned into the transitional badge, which those are pretty sought after. Those are kind of right. rare. And the transition badge <clears throat> has the blue. It's a blue thing. and and light gold badge that has the Ludwig name on it. It's the yeah. first badge that he created once he bought his name back, and then that was only used around two, maybe two years tops, and then it went back to the gold-colored Keystone badge like he did in the WFL era, but with his name at the top Ludwig. And it, that's a, one reason, which is a, one thing I always thought was kind of interesting about old Ludwig drums. There's so many different kinds of lugs, and I think one of the big reasons with that is like you've got the Imperial lug, and then I guess what, like the standard Ludwig lug with the three, you know, I don't even know what to call those ones, like the <clears throat> the one you see on every drum. It's, well, basically that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, the, the classic lug. Yeah, I mean, and, that the, the Imperial lug was the snare drum lug used yeah. on, and there was also the quote-unquote bow tie lug, which was essentially two small classic yeah. lugs together. And, and then you've got the Zephyr lug. The Zephyr think? lug was there are some, like There a, are many lugs. Yeah, yeah Zephyr lug those was cool. used <laughs> during that uh, WFL era at some point in time yeah. uh, as well. 
And, it, and many companies, they don't have a, the, as much of a variety of different types of lugs because at one point Ludwig was really two different companies and then they came back together again. Okay. So it's uh, so it's interesting stuff. Then they, they got into the, uh, you're now back into starting to get into the 60s now where uh, Bill has his name back and uh, they're starting to create instruments and we're still working off the uh, mahogany poplar mahogany three ply shells. But uh, that, so that, that lasted through until probably right around the very late uh, late 60s we started to get a, a little bit away from the mahogany poplar mahogany three ply shell with reinforcement rings they started to migrate over to maple poplar maple and if you think about the I, I think it, the logic behind it is is kind of clear if you think about mahogany poplar mahogany that was a carryover from the 40s through the 50s uh, larger drums generally because you were talking about dance band music, big bands, things like that. So you had uh, generally larger sizes, um, more of a warmth and, and body to the sound. And then as you start moving into the 60s and the advent of, of rock and roll, you start getting to the point where you need to cut more. You need a little bit more presence. And everybody has to remember that you weren't able to uh, mic instruments like you can today. So if there was a live performance, it was probably maybe no microphones at all. At most, maybe there was an overhead or two over the drum set, but um, the drummer had to work hardest of anybody because he didn't have a Marshall stack <laughs> that he could just turn the dial up to nine. Uh, now, nowadays, you go to a concert and you feel it in your heart. Back then, I think yeah. you, you actually had to have a bigger bass drum and really Well, that's exactly it, yeah. And, <laughs> and so one of the issues becomes <clears throat> maple being a harder wood is going to be uh, give you a wider tuning range to, to some degree and project more uh, because it's harder. And that that's still had rounded bearing edges though, which gave you a little bit more muffling. Uh, but you start getting beyond that period of time, starting to get into the 70s, and then they migrated away from that shell configuration to an all maple, uh, okay. six ply well, maple shell with no reinforcement range. Before we do that, you want to talk about some of the endorsers that they had kind of throughout the years? Oh my God. Because there's so many. Artists, I mean, yeah, you can, Oh, there's there's so many, and everybody's going to say you left out this one, this one, this one, and I know. But just a, a, a quick example, because it spans uh, all genres of music. But in the in the jazz world, Buddy Rich was an artist of uh, of the company, and he was that goes all the way back to when he started, I think. Right? Uh, he that was, was a Ludwig player. Company. I mean, he's he was a Ludwig player like, for probably most of his career when through he was the like 50s 12 i think right didn't he have like a big bass drum and a ludwig snare yeah. <laughs> and, and bass drum was taller than him through the 50s yep and then then uh, then he went buddy moved on and went to rogers and, and other companies over time but buddy was an artist roy haynes uh was an artist for decades joe morello for decades uh but then you, you look at other genres carl palmer from emerson lake and palmer carl you know played ludwig at a point in time still and does today mick fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac was a Ludwig artist for many, many years. Mitch Mitchell with Jimi Hendrix. Ginger Baker. I love Mitch Mitchell. He's one of yeah. my favorite rock drummers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ginger Baker. Uh, Nick Mason Ginger with, with awesome. Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah. So so you start looking, uh, Alan White with uh, with Yes. You start looking at uh, at Ludwig in terms of the, the penetration that they had across many, many different musical styles, and it's incredible. Uh, but, you know, the product was great. The product was uh, really, really well made. Did you say Ringo? Oh, of course. Well, Ringo. how can I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How can I not mention that? Yeah, Ringo, obviously. And I know it's a it's a regular story, but uh, once the Beatles hit on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, Damon Avenue went to producing drums, you know, twenty four hours a day. They were three shifts, <laughs> and they were operating twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, just to make drums. And the, the night shift at a drum company. That's fine. Right. <laughs> and there's also the story of the vo the volume was so great at that point in time that quality control was starting to have some issues. We, we should talk about the little eccentricities of 60s Ludwig drums, yeah, which so, actually makes them sound special and yeah, I mean, some good, of it, actually. <laughs> some of it's kind of interesting because uh, the, the, the most obvious one, if you look at some of those drums from that period of time, uh, you've got a floor tom, and where the seam is, from the, from the top to the bottom on, on, on the shell, it seems like there's a big bump there, and you go, oh my God, the shell's out of round, it's not good. No, it's not. The shell's fine, the drum tunes up great, and the drum sounds fantastic, but they were just working so hard and so fast that sometimes little details got overlooked, but the drums still sound great. And it's, it's cool with those Ludwigs, 
and even slinger lines from that era a lot of the times you can see if it's an original wrap because the wrap is actually wrapped that's a good into, point and i think that's where that little lump comes that's from. a good <laughs> point yes um nowadays when drums are wrapped meaning when we put like a celluloid you know plastic white marine pearl or plastic covering on that wrap is brought around the drum after the shell is formed it's added and there's a seam for the wrap during this period of time you're right Ludwig would take the wrap and make the wrap the last ply when they yeah. were laying up the shell. So if you had a three how, ply how, shell, how that even work. <laughs> well, you have a three ply shell, mahogany, poplar, mahogany, and then you've got the wrap. So they'd and actually then, put it in the, the. Yeah, you just roll the they, they, they roll the shell, the press, form the shell, put it in the press, and 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 that's it. You're done. Very but interesting. That's very very true. Uh, if you have any question about a rare wrap on that particular era of drums, if the wrap is not an intricate part of the shell, and you can see that when you look at yeah. the edge, then and you don't are, have original drum. There are people who try and fake you out sometimes because people who use like heat guns and they'll like pull it up and try and so keep yeah. your eyes out if you yeah. see like a bunch of weird. And it's but possible that's, but to that's tell only that only 100%. happens on the rarest finishes, yeah. which generally is going to be the Oyster Black Jazz Festival snare, which is the yeah. Ringo snare, and pristine examples of that sell for as much as. Four thousand dollars. So there's a reason for people to try to counterfeit those and, because, and you can tell by looking at the wrap too, because the old stuff they made in a different way. If you, if you look yeah. real close, if the pattern is like digitally printed, you can actually kind of yeah. tell. But but so, yeah, that, and the WFL era. Just a side note, those are made so well that like, oh the, yeah, I, I just sold one to yeah. a guy and he wanted me to look at the inside of the shell and he was like, is there anything imperfect in there? And I was just like, no, <laughs> it's no. A, the, every no. there's never a seam in the you know, in between the reinforcement hoops, but then you get into the 60s and they were, there's a little more uh, yeah, <laughs> imperfections it, it, in those traps. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and there's no question about it. There were <laughs> issues during that period of time, but it was issues that were caused by, quality control issues that were caused by just trying to meet demand. And the demand spiked so fast yeah. that there was no way to acquire more people and train those people. It just was one of those things that went reeling out of control when the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. But that all got back under control, it was fine. And then as you look through, um, now you're kind of into the 70s, and this is normally about where we cut it off when we think of vintage. But then, um, you know, Bill Ludwig uh, Jr., the chief, uh, uh, took over. Uh, as He was being groomed to take over by Bill Sr., obviously, for many years. And then when Bill Sr. passed away, Bill Ludwig Jr., or the chief as, as we know him, took, um, took over and ran the business. And... Um, then he, he continued the, the innovation. He had some other ideas on interesting things. You know, Ludwig brought back the super sensitive snare in the 60s, but in this case, just with that configuration of the super from the 20s. No snares under the top head, just the regular. They brought that back. One of the best snare drums in the whole world is a simple chrome over aluminum, 10 lug, superphonic 400 snare. It's an alloy shell, chrome over aluminum, and it's a great drum. It's one of the most recorded drums ever. It was a huge probably, favorite. Probably the most recorded. Yeah, the yeah. most recorded drum ever. It's a favorite. It's been a favorite of Steve Gadd for his whole entire life. And no they matter had, who he endorses. We sell a lot of these, especially the old brass ones. We should talk a little about. Oh about yeah, that. I mean, yeah. Everyone probably knows, but yeah, for but those of you out there who don't know, but that's another good point. Right around that same time when Ludwig bought his name back in the late fifties, he then also brought into the mix the brass shell snare drum that was. The, as we know them today, is Superphonic 400, even though that wasn't the name of it at that moment in time. But it's a brass shell, 10 lug drum, simple throw off, fantastic instrument. And then that was, he produced that for a few years and then took that drum and went to an aluminum shell chrome plated that made the price point very favorable and the drums sound incredible. And the 8 lug version of a Superphonic 400 is a drum called the Acrolyte. Which every school has. <laughs> every school has. And they were, it was an anodized aluminum shell. It wasn't chrome plated. Instead of 10 Imperial lugs, which are kind of a fancy Art Deco lug, there were eight of what we call the bow tie lug. And it was, you know, brand new. Those drums used to be like 60 bucks. But they're some of the best sounding drums. And the Superphonic 400, when they were brand new, they were like 100 bucks. Yeah. So those are great mainstays. They, they still, to this day, sell like crazy. If we get them in, we move them like crazy. Yeah. And I have <laughs> often said Ludwig makes uh, a superb metal shell drum even up to this day. They probably, dollar for dollar, value-wise, make the best metal shell drums in the market. Yeah, a lot of studios will call and they'll say, like, 
I just want one snare drum that will kind of work for just about everything. And, yeah. and if you're going to just get one snare, uh, the, the aluminum Supra with the steel hoops, because it's not overly ringy. Sometimes people have trouble tuning brass drums. I like them better personally, but yeah. but yeah, it's just real easy to dial in and yeah. just a I, I get the, workhorse that, of a drum. When I get those requests from people, whether it's a, a studio or someone who does work in a studio, he says, what do I need as an arsenal for drums? And the first thing I tell them is, number one, you need a chrome over aluminum Supra, period. You know, you need that. And then maybe a nice, you know, a nice wood drum. You know, maybe uh, you need a, maybe you need a piccolo, depending on what things you're yeah. doing, and maybe uh, if you can, you know, if you can swing it, get a solid shell craviato, and you you basically got got it yeah. covered, you know. <laughs> but and then a, a note about telling the difference between them: the brass ones are a lot heavier. Oh, they yeah. don't have a serial number on them usually because they're like pre-serial. Yep. Every now and then you'll find one that's kind of an exception. Yeah. It's also true. There's like parts of with the snare beds and. And uh, when it comes to the weight, I had an experience recently where we had like three or four, and I was trying to figure out whether or not it was uh, aluminum or a brass shell. Mm -hmm. But the one of the drums had an aluminum shell, but it had brass hoops. So that one weighed kind of like right in the middle. Right. And then if you have both the brass hoops and the brass shell, it's very heavy very indeed. Heavy. You can right. always tell those. But then uh, if it's steel hoops and the aluminum shell, they're just you can just toss those things in the air. They're very, very light. Very light, very light. <laughs> now, it's interesting, great stuff. And um, you know the chief, he he then uh, you know worked through innovation. He he came up with the idea for Vista Light drums, and you know there's a little uh, yeah, right here we, we got one right here. That for those of you who are not looking on, on video, but there's, a, there's a video with my dad playing this very kit in this very room. Right, that's been very popular. It's uh, it's it sounded really good. Oh, the kit sounds <laughs> incredible. This <laughs> one we call kit. this one Lifesaver uh, Vista Light because it's you know, bands of several different Vista Light colors across the whole kit. But the Vista Light was in acrylic shell and um, uh, those drums had a they had a place, they had a niche. And they came also out in the seventies? Yeah. And also uh, Ludwig was was big in uh, introducing uh, the concert tom kits. You know, basically concert toms are something that always existed in orchestras, which is basically a set of tom toms with no bottom head. And they were referred to as either concert toms or slash melodic toms. And the idea here was without the bottom head, you could do a little bit more of a pure tuning closer to notes or specific pitches. And generally those drums to dial in that pitch would have what we call, today we call it a black dot or silver dot head, but a head that had a about a four inch circle in the middle that was a reinforcement circle that would take any remaining overtones out so you could pitch those drums bing 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 and you've had eight of them you could basically pitch them to a to a scale yeah. so you saw that and uh, one of the great great users of those concert times was Hal Blaine in um, in the studios uh, in California through that period of the 60s and the 70s uh, you, you hear that a lot and you can you can thank Hal for for bringing that to the to the yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about him and his yeah. innovations yeah. and so I mean there are a lot and Hal Hal Blaine was a Ludwig artist. Yeah. So there there's the most recorded drummer of all time. It's more are or have been Ludwig artists than have not when it comes to the big oh, yeah. names and trumps. It's amazing. <laughs> so, you know, that that kind of takes us through the the period that we cover, which is like through the seventies that I consider vintage where I have expertise. We get beyond that, I don't have the expertise, so I don't comment much on it. But you know, obviously, Ludwig is still making drums today. Uh, the company is not family-owned because uh, the chief sold it uh, to Selmer uh, in 80-something or other. I can't remember the exact date. But um, Ludwig drums are still being manufactured. And then the chief's son, uh, as we call him, B3, uh, Bill Ludwig <laughs> III, <laughs> is, uh, is creating drums under the WFL, you know, uh, banner. So uh, he's kind of carrying on the, the family tradition side of it. And uh, the folks uh, who are manufacturing the Ludwig brand drums right now, the drums are great. We still love them. We, we buy, uh, we've got some that we do in a special finish for us that we, we love. And the uh, product's good. Yeah. So, I mean, there's been a long history in what, um, it, it remained a family business for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and even though it is not family owned today, it is still uh, one of the great American drum companies. And it is uh, a wonderful thing. And it was a wonderful legacy that was started by uh, Bill Ludwig Sr. 
and his brother Theobald, who did not live very long after they started this. But yeah. so it's a great legacy. It's a great legacy. Everyone should definitely check out the book. The if, oh, if yes. you want to get into details, and this has oh, this has yeah. everything in it. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank Just you. about everything you would want to know. I totally wanted to mention this. Uh, Rob <clears throat> Cook, a uh, good 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 friend of mine, who always sponsors the Chicago uh, not sponsors. He runs the Chicago Drum Show every year which is a, a true um, labor of love because there's no money to be made <laughs> trying to, to do a drum show. But Rob has done several books. He did a book on Rogers, he did a book on Gretsch, a uh, book on Slingerland, and he did the Ludwig book. And it is a wonderful, wonderful book that talks, goes very, very deep into the history. Uh, it talks about everything from Oh, uh, you know the uh, the original uh, factory locations, people who were so critically important to the business early on, Jim Catalano, so many others. Uh, it also goes through in great detail uh, the stipple stipple gold. Oh, those are different cool. finishes <laughs> that they had, whether they were yeah stipple gold, uh, certain abalone pearl finishes, and uh, some of the early early finishes in the 20s like peacock pearl streak dopal triumphals too oh and then the triumphals from the 20s which were all gold drums 100 percent gold gold plated uh hoops lugs hardware shell everything small numbers of those exist and there is a section in this book uh that features a couple of things that that were from my collection but also more importantly the collection of a good friend of mine mike corrado who's got probably the best Ludwig collection of snare drums uh, anywhere in the world. He's got um, probably about 700 snare drums, and I think he's got probably 500 Black Beauties. But These he's are also all really, really special this, drums. <laughs> he's got every model that was ever made. He's got all of the unique finishes from the early uh, years to 20s. Mike's collection basically runs from the early 1900s through into the 30s, maybe a little bit in the 40s, and that's kind of where he pretty much cuts it. But Rob Cook's book has everything uh, in it. It's got information about artists, information about the shell types, information about you know what models were made during what years. It's just an incredible document. And I'll there put was up even some a, pictures for people yeah, to see. There's even a CD with it. Uh, if you want to get this book, contact Rob at Rebeats, R-E-B-E-A-T-S, Rebeats.com. And we sell it too. We also sell it. I don't know if I it's still in production. That's what I don't know. I think that one is. I think they, they stopped one of the lady ones, but yeah. I, think that, I but, think it is. But this is a great piece, and it's a great uh, reference book, and it's just great historical information. It, it, can tell, it can tell the story far better than I can. So if you can, you oh, should yeah, pick we, this book we up. We only have so much time here because I, I know everyone's going to say, oh, what about this, what about that, and oh, I it's know. all in there. So yeah, there, for the real is, specific. Yeah, Th- <laughs> this podcast could be, you know, 12 hours long if we talked about everything to the degree that we'd like to, but we gotta we got to be reasonable. we got to go sell drums. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right and let everybody get back to what they're doing. So uh, I hope that was helpful. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're going to do some more. We'll do, uh, we'll do, we still need to do Slingerland. We still need to do Gretsch. Uh, Leedy. And we'll do Leedy. And uh, we'll also do Campco. And maybe uh, Fives, too. Oh, yeah. Well, Fives, fives, yeah, I'm going to say f- Fives, fives is a personal favorite of mine. So yeah, we're that one will be able to get real detailed with because it's just a little, you know, less. Uh, yes. The company was only around for, well, I mean, less than these companies. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, much shorter, much shorter. So, hope uh, hope that was good. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Tune in next time. Thank you. <laughs>